Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back up here. We've had Christmas programs, singing programs. Uh, last week's program I really enjoyed. Like I said, the choir does such a good job. I'm going to ask something big from you one day. And that is going to be a cantata. <laughs> See, that's why I haven't asked you yet. <laughs> I know. You know what? I got, I got to tell you that if you don't really, um, if you're not musically inclined, and you look back and go, they're just singing one song. You don't really realize what's, what it takes to put that one song together. And you don't actually realize, if you don't know music, you realize each one of those people have a specific part they have to, and they have to practice their parts all together. I used to laugh, it's like, okay, so they have practice every Sabbath. Why? How long does it take you to learn one song? But then you start to see, okay, well, you guys have this, and this person has that, and they got to bring it all together. I give you all a lot of credit. You do such a beautiful job. And the choir, you guys that participate in the choir, <laughs> you sound so good. So good. That's why I want to hear sometime one day a full cantata. Just think about it. Just think about it. It's easy for me to say, isn't it? <laughs> Yesterday we celebrate the birth of Jesus. This time of year, the world will stop and acknowledge Jesus Christ. They will acknowledge that He came. Uh, as was shared this morning, people are more loving, more caring. We were out at a restaurant, and uh, this man paid for our meal. Wow. That's what I said, wow, because I knew what the bill was going to be. It's like, hmm, wow. thank you, Lord. But what he did is he saw us praying before we ate. He came over to the table, and he thanked us for actually praying in public. And he says, your meal is taken care of. Can you turn me down a little bit? Yes, a little bit. And that touched, that touched my heart. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that just touched my heart. So this time of year is very good for witnessing, for sharing, because again, the world's attention is focused on this baby. But what I hope is as seasoned, let me try that one more time, seasoned Christians, we have matured enough not to just look at the baby. Yes. Because you weren't saved by the baby. Amen. You were saved by the man. Amen. But what I want to ask you is that. Is God all powerful? Yes. Is God all knowing? Yes. Does God know the end from the beginning? Yes. So when he sent Jesus as a baby, and you're told in the narrative of the Gospels, was his life really ever in danger? Right? Why? God is all powerful. He always said, He's all knowing. Wouldn't He know that Herod wanted to kill Him before Jesus ever came? Yes. Right? Yes. Wouldn't He know the exact time, the exact moment? Was Jesus' life really in danger? Yes. yes. Do you know why? And this will help you understand why God allows things to happen in your life. Why you experience things that may be bad, painful, or traumatic. That is because God will allow things to happen. Now, here's something to think about. Whose will was it for Herod to look to take the life of the baby Jesus? And Herod. There you go, thank you. It may have been Satan's desire. But he wanted to use a human agent. And that human agent would have been Herod. Is that correct? Yes. Did Herod have any say so in the choice that he made? Yes. yes. Right? So Herod made a decision that he would allow his own hatred and his own fear to open him up to be used by Satan to continue this plan. Have you ever really thought about how this great controversy works? Think about this. 
If Herod wasn't in that position, don't you think Satan would have found somebody else? Absolutely. But that somebody else would have had to make that choice themselves. Is that right? Yeah. Say all this to you to get you to think that God has given you two of the greatest gifts. The first gift is His Son, Jesus Christ. The second gift is the freedom of choice. Amen. And do you understand the freedom of choice that God has given you will allow people to make bad choices. That will allow people to make choices that may hurt you. And God respects that freedom to sometimes allow that to happen. So let's look at Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus and let's look and see was Jesus' life really in danger? Tells you verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying to Joseph, What? Son of David, what? Do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. Take this woman as your wife. It's okay because the child that she carries is conceived by the Holy Ghost. Now, who told Joseph this? An angel. A messenger of the Lord. Is that right? Nice. Isn't that what angels are? Yes. Messengers of the Lord. Now, is that the only time that an angel came to Joseph concerning this child? No. Right? So, again, God sends an angel, tells Joseph, and Joseph has to make a decision. Now, keep that in mind as we continue to read the narrative. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And you shall bring forth a son and shall call his name what? Jesus. Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying. So here you go. Did God know this was going to happen before it happened? Yes. Yes. Has anything taken by surprise? No. So again. Was his life really in danger? Well, let's consider this and move on. See, so let's go down to chapter, uh, hold on, hold on. Let's look at chapter 1. What verse? 24. <laughs> My glasses are having a hard time focusing. Give me a second here. Let's look at verse 13 of chapter 2. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, What? Right. Take, the young. Take the young child and his mother and flee where? Egypt. Okay, so... Now, God knew this was going to happen before it happened, correct? But He shows him in a dream, and He tells him, Arise. Does that mean after He got His eight hours? No. Does that mean like right now? Yeah. Right now. Can you see in that verse, was there an imperative to do something to act very quickly? Yes. Okay, so you see, if his life wasn't really in danger, Joseph could have kept on sleeping. And he could have made breakfast the next morning, and he could have got all this stuff together, and then he could have left. But the angel says to do what? Arise now. Take the baby and take the mother and go down where? Egypt. You know how far Egypt was from where he was at? What? And they didn't have the minivan. You know what I'm saying? They couldn't catch the bus. Think of what this was like for Mary and Joseph, okay? That she gets waking up in the middle of the night saying, get your stuff together, we have to leave. Mm. Now, isn't it funny that she doesn't, there, there's no narrative in there about what her reaction was? 
She didn't say, dude, do you know what time it is? I just got to see. Mary did what Mary always had done. That was to submit to what God wanted. When she was told, arise, take the child, let's go down into Egypt, what did she do? She arose, she got the child ready, and they went down to Egypt. Right? So, I want you to understand, as you think about this Christmas story, what we celebrated, I want you to understand that God took a huge risk. I meet a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who they thought that all this was played, nothing would ever happen to this child. This was God's son. He would let nothing happen to this child. This child's life was never really in danger. Was it? Yes. Could this baby have been killed? Yes. Could anything have happened to it? Yes. Was God protecting it? Yes. But do you understand, there was great risk here. How... How much of its own needs can a baby supply? None. None. Absolutely zero. It is totally dependent on outside forces to take care of every single need it has. Was this baby any different? When Jesus was born and he came from his mother as a newborn, he was just as helpless as every other newborn that had ever been born. Can you imagine what the father was feeling when this time came? Can you imagine what the loyal angels were feeling when this time came? Do you think there was any hesitation when God gave the command to the angel to go to Joseph to tell him to take this job? It was probably 10,000 years Okay? Right there. Because they knew the risk that the Father had taken. Do you realize the risk that Jesus took to go from being God and all that encompasses? I can speak worlds into being to now being a baby. Humanity wrapped up in flesh. Containing all that power all that divinity, and you look into this baby, and it's as helpless as every other child that was ever born. Amen. So when the call came in verse 13, what did they do? They arose. They arose. Verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night. Why did he go by night? Because that way he could sneak out and not be found by Herod's soldiers, right? So if there was no way this child could have been hurt, could have been destroyed, there would be no reason for him to go by night. Now some people have told me that they went by night because you know how hot it is over there in the daytime? Can you imagine traveling with a baby in the daytime? It was about the actual threat that was to this. Do you think they would have, do you think any good Jewish man would have wanted to take his brand new baby down into Egypt? Be like you taking your baby to Las Vegas. Think about that, right? Is that a good place to raise a nice, good Jewish boy down in Egypt? Again, as we celebrate Christmas, and we have opened all the presents. Christmas is a great time 25 days before. But then the day comes and it's over with that quick. And you go through all the festivities, you open all the presents, you eat your meal, and it's over with. A month worth of getting ready for one day. And then what happens the next day? It's just... <sighs> Right? You got 364 days to prepare for the next one. <laughs> this spirit, I remember sitting in the restaurant and watching CNN, and they were, they were 
discussing the true spirit of Christmas. Okay? So they had a, uh, a priest on there. They had some other person that was probably like a Unitarian. Um, and so they were getting all different ideas. The person on the street, what is the true spirit and the meaning of Christmas? You could ask a hundred people and get a hundred different answers. Think about the day after Christmas, okay? It's 25, 30 days you prepared for this. You have everything wrapped and all looks pretty in the tree. And then in two, three minutes, it's all open, it's done, and you never feel that letdown? You never that letdown? Jesus Christ was not given to us to be a letdown. Amen. Christmas wasn't meant to get so excited for one day and then after a couple of hours it's over and then you're let down. Jesus was given so that he could bring you up and build you up and give you an, ass an assurance, an excitement. You guys lost that excitement? New life. Listen, all you guys, I'm looking at the, the ages of people here. And most of you guys have grown kids. <laughs> All right? Yes. Some of you guys still have kids, but a lot of you have grandkids. Even as grandparents, isn't it still exciting to see their faces when they open their presents? Yes. Isn't that what you actually look forward to? I mean, what I found is the older I get, it's, it's not what I get under the tree. It is the excitement of looking at the children's faces. Or the excitement on your loved one's face when you give her that present. Or she's looking for the excitement on your face when you receive something that shows how much they care about you. Right? Isn't that what the Christmas spirit is supposed to be about? That you're able to see and show love. When you see the excitement in these children's faces, they open that present. That's what you live for. That excitement is what you should have when you think about your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How quickly does that fade? It will fade just as quickly as the excitement on those children's faces after they open everything. They put all the toys to the side and you play with the box. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Box. <laughs> the gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ throughout the year is supposed to bring us that joy, that excitement, that anticipation. And if you lose that, Jesus sent you a love letter contained in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. It's the seven letters to the seven churches. And he speaks to one of them about losing their first love. And he wants you to come back. He wants you to see the excitement of His birth. He wants you to see the joy and the anticipation that was on the face of those two really old people that were in the temple. Remember those two guys? There was a guy and a girl. The one old man said, I'm not going to die until I see the face of the Messiah. Amen. And when he saw the face of the Messiah, of the Messiah what did he say? I can depart in peace. He didn't mean I could go out of the temple and everything was good. He meant that he could lay down and die and know that the salvation of Israel was here and he got to hold it. He got to look into that baby's face. <clears throat> and he knew that this baby wouldn't stay a baby. See, this is the problem with the world. The world will accept Jesus as long as he's a harmless baby. But Jesus didn't stay a baby, did he? And that old man looked into the eyes of his Savior. He knew that he would grow up to be a man and he would take the sins of the people on himself and he would shed his blood. And he told his mother that a spear shall pierce her heart as well. Look at this child, but don't keep him as an infant. Let him grow up to full maturity and let him live in your heart. Let the excitement of Christian, or Christmas be the excitement of Jesus giving his life for you because he loves you. Amen. Amen.
Amen. No greater love has any man than that he would lay his life down for his friends. Jesus said, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. What is it, bless you, what is it like to be a friend of God? Wouldn't you like that to be on your tombstone if you die before the Lord comes? Oh, man. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be like the best epitaph ever? He or she was a friend of God. Brothers and sisters, this is what the babe in Bethlehem offers to you and I. That we can be a friend of Listen, the greatest thing about that, have you ever wanted to be a friend with somebody and they rejected you? They didn't want your friendship? Um, you know how that feels? Um, Jesus didn't come so that we can be friends with God. God did the searching. God wants to be your friend. Amen. Now if the Lord will use him. Think of the greatest person in history outside of Jesus who you've looked up to, who you hold in high esteem, okay? Whether it's the leader of a government, whether it's a military man, or whether it's somebody who changed the world in some way. Think of that person. If that person came to you and wanted to be your friend, would you turn them down? Why does the world turn away Jesus Christ who has given everything to be their friend and we reject that invitation even those who call on his name sometimes rejects that invitation what is the greatest gift you've ever received that you've unwrapped under your Christmas tree. If you're like me, you go, I don't know. Right? I don't know. How many Christmases? I've been here 53 years. I've gone through 53 Christmases. There's not really one that stands out. I can tell you the greatest gifts that I've received in my life. A mother who loved me. The face of my son and my daughter. A wife who has accepted me for my flaws. My selfishness. <laughs> the things that drive her nuts. Which were also the things that actually attracted her to me in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes? Yeah. You know how that goes? <laughs> The differences that attract you, but it's the differences that after a long-term period drive you crazy. <laughs> but when my wife tells me she loves me, and I know that to be true, none of that is in comparison to what I have received in Jesus Christ. <laughs> none of that can even come close to what I have experienced in giving my heart fully to God's <coughs> Jesus Christ. And understanding that God knows me better than my wife knows me. God knows the secret things that my wife doesn't know. And God loves me anyway. Amen. And He doesn't just love me, He actively pursues me. Oh. And that God found me in a pigsty and I was covered in filth. And He took me and He loved me enough not to leave me there. Amen. But He picked me up. And he cleaned me off and he gave me his robe of righteousness. Hallelujah. And that in him, he looked at me as if I had never made one mistake. Amen. And that when he sees me, he sees his son. Not that he goes, I don't like you, so I'm going to put the picture of Jesus in front of you. <laughs> when he sees me, he sees his son. When he sees you, he sees a son or a daughter. And he loves me just as much as he loved Jesus Christ. Amen. And he has done everything to save me and bring me home. 
Are we home yet? No. We're not home yet, but brothers and sisters, what I found is in Christ, I'm home. Wherever I'm at, whatever happens, I'm home. Here, with you, look around. Are you going to heaven? Because you're the faces that I'm going to see when I get there. You're the faces I'm going to be looking for when I see my Savior because he's the first one I want to see. But then I want to see you. And if you're not there, how can I spend eternity? There is a piece of my heart that each one of you felt. Now think about that when it comes to God. Because you are made in His image. God breathed into you life. I can't, I can't give that to you. I can say that my wife and I, we made our son and daughter. God breathed life into them. They're not created in my image. They're created in His image. And every person that has ever lived has a place in God's heart. Can you imagine what it's like for Him? To see his children rejected. And when the end comes, they're not going to be there. Now listen, God in his mercy is going to wipe away every tear. And the former things will be forgotten. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Who wipes away his tears? Does he forget? No. Throughout eternity. This God has done everything for you. As you celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, understand just what that gift really is. And when you face the end of this year and come into the next year, I pray that it's your resolution that you will give your heart fully, completely, without anything holding you back to the service of your God. Amen. Closing him is hymn number 125. Keep coming up closer. Ready? 